We live in days of environmental crisis. And ancient biblical writers were well aware that humans can often live out of sync with their environments. The Eden story pictures a garden planted by God in which human beings live in harmony with God, one another, and with the world around them. And God not only planted this garden, but he loves to walk in the cool of the day. In this narrative, humans are gardeners called to cultivate and tend the garden. The lush and varied vegetation provides richly for them. And in this tale, trees symbolize beauty, sustenance, and provision. And as such, they represent life, one especially so, a tree in the center of the garden, the tree of life, which brings eternal life to those who will eat it alongside of which is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only tree forbidden to them. And it was misusing this one tree that is the act of disobedience that brings about the rupture between humans and God, humans and one another, humans and their environments. Here is a reading from Genesis chapter 3. To Adam God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you are you will return. When thinking about the environmental crisis and as it relates to plants and trees, it would be especially easy to turn to statistics and worrying facts and figures about deforestation and such like. But what I want to do instead is to try and sensitize us to a different way of seeing plants and trees. Because acting differently towards our environment begins with perceiving it differently. Thomas Merton wrote, A tree gives glory to God by being a tree. For in being what God means it to be, it is obeying him. It consents, so to speak, to his creative love. It's expressing an idea which is in God and which is not distinct from the essence of God and therefore a tree imitates God by being a tree. The more a tree is like itself, the more it is like him. This particular tree will give glory to God by spreading out its roots in the earth and raising its branches into the air and the light in a way that no other tree before or after it ever did or will do. Each particular being in its individuality, its concrete nature and entity with its own characteristics gives glory to God by being precisely what he wants it to be here and now in the circumstances ordained for it by his love and his infinite art. And then I especially like this bit. The pale flowers of the dogwood outside this window are saints. The little yellow flowers that nobody notices on the edge of that road are saints looking up into the face of God. The poet Gerard Manley Hopkins states and has and shares this same kind of spiritual sensibility towards nature. Binzi Poplars is a poem that expresses his horror when a row of trees in Oxford, was, which he loved particularly, was cut down. So I'm going to read the poem. You've got it in your sheets, so please follow it, but don't worry about understanding every word or line of it. You'll get the gist of it. My Aspen's dear whose airy cages quelled, quelled or quenched in leaves the leaping sun, all felled, felled, are all felled. Of a fresh and following folded rank, not spared, not one that dandled a sandaled shadow that swam or sank on meadow and river and wind-wandering weed-winding bank. Oh, if we but knew what we do when we delve or hew, hack or rack the growing green, since country is so tender to touch 
her being so slender that like this sleek and seeing ball, but a prick will make no eye at all. Where we, even where we mean to mend her, we end her when we hew or delve. Aftercomers cannot guess the beauty being. Ten or twelve, only ten or twelve strokes of havoc unselve the sweet special scene, rural scene, a rural scene, sweet especial rural scene. So just take a couple of minutes, we're going to have a couple of minutes of silence. Again, don't worry about understanding every line. Just pick one line or phrase or image that jumps out at you and ponder it for a couple of minutes. I don't know what struck you. I, mean, I was, um, we won't have time to share, but I was struck this time by the word unselve, which is a word Gerald Manley Hopkins invented. It's as if um, an ecosystem and a scene has a self, a personality, that by the trees being chopped down has been taken away. It's been unmade a self. So from the tree at the center of Eden to another tree at the heart of the Bible, this tree too was abused and misused and became a curse. I speak of the cross on which our Lord was crucified. The New Testament quite often speaks about Jesus being hung or crucified on a tree. I put all the references at the bottom of your picture sheet. If ever a tree was abused, it was this one becoming the unwilling means by which its own creator was hacked and racked, cut down, felled, felled, all felled. Christ on the tree is cursed, sharing in the curse of creation. But the Easter God is not one to let a story end in curse and death. And in another nearby garden there lies an empty tomb, and the one once dead is now very much alive, mistaken for the gardener perhaps not such as great a mistake as we might think. And in the transforming topsy-turvy power of God, the cursed tree on Golgotha is transmuted into the blessed tree of life from Eden, the tree at the center of the world from which eternal life flows to all who will receive it. God takes this very abuse of his creation and makes it into a means of blessing and renewing creation. Um, if you have a look at the pictures in your sheets, you'll see various different images of Christ being
being crucified on a tree. Um, I'm not asking you to think of all of them, but if any of them stand out, just take a couple of minutes to reflect on an image that strikes you as Christ on the cross and the cross as a tree of life. So we'll take two minutes for that. Please stand. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Christ was manifest in the body, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, glorified in high heaven. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world.